from Los Angeles, California, the entertainment capital of the world, it's the 80s Movie Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Havens. Thank you for listening today. On this episode, we're going to be looking back at a movie that will be celebrating its 40th anniversary of its original theatrical release this week. A movie that would turn one of its leads into a star and thrust its director into the mainstream, at least for a short time. We're talking about the 1983 Martha Coolidge film, Valley Girl, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary. It's released this Saturday with a special screening tonight, Thursday, April 27, 2023, at the Chinese Theater in Hollywood with its director doing a Q&A after the show. But as always, before we get to Valley Girl, we head back in time. A whole 11 months, in fact, to May 1982. That month, the avant-garde musical genius known as Frank Zappa released his 35th album, Ship Arriving Too Late to Save a Drowning Witch. Released on Zappa's own Barking Pumpkin record label, Drowning Witch would feature a song he co-wrote with his 14-year-old daughter, Moon Unit Zappa. Frank would regularly hear his daughter make fun of the young female mall rats she would encounter throughout her days. And one night, Frank would be noodling around in his home recording studio when inspiration struck. He would head up to Moon's room, wake her up, and bring her down to the studio asking her to just repeat that silly Val-speak voice she did all the crazy things she heard being said at parties, bar mitzvahs, and the Sherman Oaks Gallery to Shopping Center, which would become famous just a couple months later as the mall where many of the kids from Ridgemont High were in Amy Heckerling's breakthrough movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High. For about an hour, Frank would record Moon spouting off typical Valley Girl phrases before he sent her back up to room to go back to sleep. In a couple of days, Frank Zappa would bring his band, which at the time included guitar virtuoso Steve Vai in his first major musical gig, into the home studio to lay down the music to this weird little song he wrote around his daughter's vocals. Valley Girl would not be a celebration of the San Fernando Valley, an area Zappa described as a most depressing place, or the way that these young ladies presented themselves. Zappa in general hated boring, generic, repetitive music, but Valley Girl would be one of the few songs Zappa would ever write or record that followed a traditional 4-4 time signature. In the spring of 1982, the influential Los Angeles radio station KROQ would obtain an acetate disc of the song several weeks before Drowning Witch was to be released on an unsuspecting public. Zappa himself thought it was a hoot the station that had broken such bands as The Cars, Duran Duran, The Police, Talking Heads, and U2 would even consider playing his song but Carol Q was his daughter's favorite radio station, and she was able to persuade the station to play the song during an on-air interview with her. The kids at home, as they say, went nuts for the song, demanding the station play it again, and again, and again. Other radio stations across the country started to get calls from their listeners wanting to hear the song that hadn't officially been released yet, and Zappa's record label would rush to get copies out to any radio station that asked for it. The song would prove to be very popular, becoming the only single of the 40-plus Zappa released during his recording career to become a top 40 radio hit, peaking at number 32. Ironically, the song would popularize the very cadence it was mocking with teenagers around the country. And the next time Zappa and his band The Mothers of Invention would tour, he would apologize to the Zappa faithful her having created a hit record. The sad truth, he would say before going into the song, is that if one continues to make music year after year, eventually something will be popular. I spent my career fighting against creating marketable art, but this one slipped through the cracks. I promised to do my best never to have it happen again. As the song was becoming popular in Los Angeles, actor Wayne Crawford and producer Andrew Lane had been working on a screenplay about star-crossed lovers that was meant to be a cheap, quickie exploitation film not unlike Zapped or Porky's. But after hearing Zappa's song, the pair would quickly rewrite the lead character, Julie, into a valley girl and retitle their screenplay Bad Boys. Yes, boys with a Z. As Valley Girl. Atlantic Entertainment Company, an independent film production company, had recently started their own distribution company and were looking for movies that could be made quickly, cheaply, and might be able to become some kind of small hit. One of the scripts that would cross their desk were Crawford and Lane's Valley Girl. And within a week, Atlantic would already have a $350,000 budget set aside to make the film. The first thing they would need was a director. 
Enter Martha Coolidge. A graduate of the same New York University film program that would give us Joel Cohen, Amy Heckerling, Ang Lee, Spike Lee, and Todd Phillips, Coolidge had been working under the tutelage of Academy Award winner Francis Ford Coppola at the filmmaker Zoetrope Studios. She had made her directorial debut, Not a Pretty Picture, in 1976, but the film, a docudrama based on Coolidge's own date rape she suffered at the age of 16, would not find a big audience. She had made another movie, City Girl, with Peter Rieger and Colleen Camp in 1982, with Peter Bogdanovich as a producer, but the film's potential release was canceled when Bogdanovich's company, Moon Pictures, went bankrupt after the release of his 1981 movie, They All Laughed, which we covered last year. She knew she needed to get on a film with a good chance of getting released, and with Coppola's encouragement, Coolidge would throw her proverbial hat into the ring for Valley Girl. And she would get the job, in part because she had some directing experience, but also because she was willing to accept the $5,000 Atlantic was offering for the position. Now that she had the job, it was time for Coolidge to get to casting. It was her goal to show an authentic teenage experience in Los Angeles in the early 80s, absent of stereotypes. As someone whose background was in documentary filmmaking, Coolidge wanted Valley Girl to feel as real as possible. Her first choice for the role of Randy, the proto-punk Romeo to Julie's, well, Juliet, Coolidge was keen on a 23-year-old unknown who had not yet acted in anything in movies, on television, or even a music video. Judd Nelson had been studying with Stella Adler in New York City, and there was something about his look that Coolidge really liked. But when she offered the role to Nelson, he had just booked an acting gig that would make him unavailable when the film would be shooting. So it was back to the pile of headshots that had been sent to the production office. And in that pile, she would find the headshot of 18-year-old Nicolas Cage, who at the time only had one movie credit, as one of Judge Reinhold's co-workers in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Coolidge would show the photo to her casting director, telling them they needed to find someone like him someone who wasn't a conventionally handsome movie actor. So the casting director did just that, went out and got someone like Nick Cage, specifically Nick Cage. What Coolidge didn't know was that Cage's real name was Nicholas Coppola and that his uncle was Coolidge's boss. She would only learn this when she called the actor to offer him the role and he mentioned he would need to check his schedule on the Coppola movie he was about to start shooting on, Rumblefish. Francis Coppola made sure the shooting schedule was rearranged so his nephew could accept his first leading role. For Julie, Coolidge wanted only one person, Deborah Foreman, a 20-year-old former model who had only done commercials for McDonald's at this point in her career. Although she was born in Montebello, California, mere miles from the epicenter of the San Fernando Valley, Foreman had spent her formative years in Texas and knew nothing about the whole Valley Girl phenomenon until she was cast in the film. Supporting roles would be filled with a number of up-and-coming young actors, including Elizabeth Daly and Michelle Mayrink as Julie's friends, Cameron Dye as Randy's best friend, and Michael Bowen as Julie's ex-boyfriend, while Julie's parents would be played by Frederick Forrest and Colleen Camp, two industry veterans who had briefly worked together on Apocalypse Now. As the scheduled start date of October 25, 1982 rolled closer, Martha Coolidge would be the first director to really learn just how far Nicolas Cage was willing to go for a role. He would start sleeping in his car to better understand Randy, and he would, as Randy, write Foreman's character Julie a poem that, according to a May 2020 New York Times oral history about the film, Foreman still had to that day. In a 2018 IMDb talk with director Kevin Smith, Cage would say that it was easy for his performance to happen in the film because he had a massive crush on Foreman during the making of the film. Because of the film's extremely low budget, the filmmakers would often shoot on locations throughout Los Angeles they did not have permits for, stealing shots wherever they could. But the one place they would spend money on was the movie's soundtrack, punctuated by live performances by Los Angeles band The Plimsolls and local singer Josie Cotton, which were filmed at the Sunset Strip Club, now known as The Viper Room. The film would only have a 20-day shooting schedule, which meant scenes would have to be shot quickly and efficiently with as few hiccups as possible. But this wouldn't stop Cage from occasionally improvising little bits that Coolidge loved so much she would keep them in the film, such as Randy spitting gum at Julie's ex and the breakup scene where Randy digs into Julie by using her valve speak. 
In early January 1983, while the film was still being edited, Frank Zappa would file a lawsuit against the film, seeking $100,000 in damages and an injunction to stop the film from being released, saying the film would unfairly dilute the trademark of his song. The lawsuit would force Coolidge to have a cut of her movie ready to screen for the judge before she was fully done with it. But when Coolidge screened this rushed cut to Atlantic and its lawyers, the distributor was pleasantly surprised to see the director hadn't made just a quickie exploitation film, but something with genuine heart and soul that could probably have a much longer lifespan. They were originally planning on releasing the film during the latter part of the summer movie season, but now knowing what they had on their hands, Atlantic would set an April 29th release date, pending, of course, on the outcome of the Zappa lawsuit. In March, the judge would issue their ruling in favor of the film, saying that there would be no confusion in the public's mind between the song and the film, and Atlantic would continue to prepare for the late April release. One of the things Coolidge really fought for was to have a wall of great new wave songs throughout the film, something Atlantic was hesitant to pay for until they saw Coolidge's cut. They would spend another $250,000 on top of the $350,000 production budget to secure songs from the Psychedelic Furs, the Payolas, Men at Work, Tony Basil, the Flirts, and Sparks, on top of the songs played by the Plimsolls and Josie Cotton in the film. Valley Girl would be one of three new movies opening on April 29th, alongside Disney's adaptation of the Ray Bradbury story Something Wicked This Way Comes, and The Hunger, the directorial debut of filmmaker Tony Scott. Opening on only 442 screens, Valley Girl would come in fourth place for the weekend, grossing $1.86 million in its first three days. However, its $4,200 per screen average would be better than every movie in the top 15 including the number one film in the nation that weekend, Flashdance. Not bad for a film that was only playing in one-third of the country. In its second weekend, Valley Girl would fall to seventh place with $1.33 million worth of tickets sold, but its per-screen average would only be second to the new Cheech and Chong movie, Still Smokin'. And over the next three months, the film would continue to perform well, never playing in more screens than it did its opening weekend, but never falling out of the top 15 while Atlantic was tracking it. When all was said and done, Valley Girl would have grossed $17.34 million in the United States. Not bad for a return on a $600,000 production and music clearance budget. There was supposed to be an accompanying soundtrack album for the film that, according to the movie's poster, would be released on Epic Records, a subsidy of Columbia Records whose eclectic roster of artists included Michael Jackson, The Clash, and Liza Minnelli. But it turns out the filmmakers only ended up getting music clearances for the movie So that release would get canceled. A six-song mini-LP would be created through a label Atlantic Pictures created called Roadshow Records, but then that album got canceled even though some copies had been printed. So it wouldn't be until 1994 that an actual soundtrack for the film would be released by Rhino Records. That release would do so well, Rhino Records released a second soundtrack album the following year. The lawsuit from Zappa would not be the only court proceeding concerning the film. In July 1984, Martha Coolidge, her cinematographer Frederick Elms, and two of the actresses, Colleen Camp and Lee Purcell, sued Atlantic Records for $5 million, saying they were owed a portion of the film's profits based on agreements in their contract. The two sides would later settle out of court. Nicolas Cage, of course, would become one of the biggest movie stars in the world, winning an Oscar in 1996 for his portrayal of an alcoholic Hollywood screenwriter who goes to Las Vegas to drink himself to death. Deborah Foreman would not have as successful a career. After Valley Girl, it would be another two years before she was seen on screen again, which is basically amounts to an extended cameo in Martha Coolidge's 1985 film Real Genius. She would have a decent 1986, starring in two semi-successful films, the sexy comedy My Chauffeur and the black comedy April Fool's Day, but after that, the roles would be less frequent and often not the lead. By 1991, she would retire from acting, appearing only in a 2011 music video for the She Wants Revenge song Must Be the One, and a cameo in the 2020 remake of Valley Girl starring Jessica Roth of the Happy Death Day movies. After Valley Girl, Martha Coolidge would go on a tear directing four more movies over the next seven years. And we'll talk about that first movie, Joy of Sex, on our next episode. Thank you for joining us. 
Remember to visit this episode's page on our website, the80smoviepodcast.com, for extra materials about Valley Girl. The 80s Movie Podcast has been researched, written, narrated, and edited by Edward Havens for idiosyncratic entertainment. Thank you again. Good night.